Raz jeszcze dzień dobry. Tym razem na części dzień dobry. O jak ładnie. Prawie jak na, prawie jak na części wcześniejszej dotyczącej maluchów. Miło mi powitać wszystkich Państwa, którzy do nas dołączyli, również tych, którzy o tej porze zasiedli przed swoimi komputerami, żeby obejrzeć sesję Robadina. Agnieszka Hebel-Szymańska. Justyna Skawiańczyk-Żur. I witamy Państwa na sesji dotyczącej uczenia nastolatków. Propozycje Pearsona dla tej grupy wiekowej e, obejmują dość szeroką ofertę. Najnowszym naszym e, kursem, o którym dzisiaj troszeczkę więcej powiemy, jest seria Gold Experience. E, nasza pomoc dla Państwa i wsparcie to nie tylko podręczniki, wysokiej jakości podręczniki, ale również szkolenia, szkolenia takie jak dzisiaj oraz szkolenia online. Bardzo szeroka tematyka, za, zachęcam do zapoznania się. Zestawy dla Państwa, zestawy w dwóch formach, w formie tradycyjnej, ale również w formie cyfrowej. Bardzo często i dużo ostatnio mówimy o e-panelu. Czy wszyscy Państwo wiedzą, czym jest e-panel? Nasza cyfrowa biblioteka, w której mogą uzyskać Państwo dostępu, dostęp do wszystkich materiałów, z jakich Państwo korzystają. Czyli zarówno do materiałów takich jak książka ucznia, książka nauczyciela, ale również materiał audio i testy do poszczególnych serii. Aby taki dostęp od nas uzyskać, należy mailowo najlepiej poinformować swojego konsultanta o tym, że chcecie Państwo skorzystać z takich materiałów. Taki dostęp zostanie Państwu przyznany i można korzystać z wersji cyfrowych naszych materiałów. E-panel to jedna rzecz, druga rzecz to też miejsce warte odwiedzania, czyli bank materiałów na naszej stronie. Słów kilka na temat egzaminów, nieco później. Rozszyfrujemy skrót PTE i powiem, czym jest PTE General. Gold Experience to naj, nasz najnowszy pięciopoziomowy kurs dla ambitnych nastolatków. Kurs, który, e, e, ktu, kurs, który jest zgodny z egzaminami Cambridge for Schools, e, ze zmianami, które wejdą w życie w roku 2015. Co ważnego e, należy wiedzieć o, o tej serii? Po pierwsze jest to aktualna tematyka, ciekawe tematy dostosowane do zainteresowań nastolatków. Po drugie bardzo atrakcyjne lekcje Creel oraz y, materiał DVD. Materiał DVD, gdzie znajdą Państwo dwa rodzaje filmów. Po pierwsze filmy dokumentalne, które są związane z tematyką danej lekcji, a po drugie wideoblogi. Um, Gold Experience to również y, komponent online, poza papierowym workbookiem, który y, zawiera utrwalanie gramatyki i słownictwa, ma, oddajemy do Państwa dyspozycji My English Lab. Interaktywne ćwiczenia, które pozwalają trwalać zarówno gramatykę, jak i słownictwo, ale też ćwiczyć poszczególne umiejętności y, językowe. Również słuchanie, znajdą tam Państwo, znajdą tam Państwo również materiał wideo. Zajrzyjmy do środka podręcznika My Gold Experience. Na uwagę zasługuje bogata szata graficzna oraz dobór tematów, który na pewno przypadnie do, do gustu nastolatkom. W Gold Experience położyliśmy duży nacisk na zrównoważone ćwiczenie, zrównoważone ćwiczenie wszystkich sprawności językowych, a w sekcji egzam znajdą Państwo wskazówki, zadania egzaminacyjne, które szczególnie przydadzą się uczniom przystępującym do najpopularniejszych egzaminów. Tworzenie wypowiedzi pisemnej to wciąż nieodłączna część większości egzaminów, dlatego też właśnie w Gold Experience poświęciliśmy dużo uwagi właśnie pisaniu. Krok po kroku w sekcji writing przygotowujemy do tworzenia wypowiedzi pisemnej, a wskazówki językowe i, i pomocne słownictwo uczniowie znajdują w bardzo przejrzystych, klarownych ramkach. Wisienką na torcie w podręczniku Gold Experience jest sekcja Switch On i ta sekcja y, to sekwencja ćwiczeń oparta na atrakcyjnym materiale wideo i podsumowana projektem. Jeśli projekt kojarzy się Państwu z kolejnym wypracowaniem do poprawienia, to tutaj Gold Experience Państwa zaskoczy, gdyż te projekty realizowane są w bardzo różnej formie, w postaci krótkich filmików, wywiadów, pracy w grupie lub też multimedialnej prezentacji. 
Tak przygotowana do egzaminu młodzież może stanąć przed wyborem, do jakiego egzaminu podejść. Tak jak powiedziałyśmy, egzaminy Cambridge to jeden z typów egzaminów, do których przygotowuje Gold Experience. I tutaj właśnie pojawia się PTE. Być może nie wszyscy Państwo wiedzą, że Pearson to również egzaminy. PTE General to egzamin dla młodzieży i dorosłych na sześciu poziomach zaawansowania. Egzamin, który jest respektowany przez wiele instytucji i uniwersytetów w Polsce i, i na całym świecie. To, co ważne, jest to egzamin, który w bardzo dużej mierze skupia się na prawdziwym, żywym języku. Składa się z dwóch części. Część pisemna obejmuje rozumienie tekstu słuchanego, czytanego oraz pisanie. Natomiast część ustna skupia się na sprawdzeniu znajomości języka w bardzo komunikacyjnym kontekście. Opiera się na autentycznych sytuacjach i, tak jak mówię, głównym, głównym celem jest sprawdzenie umiejętności komunikacji w danym języku. Jeśli która ze szkół językowych byłaby zainteresowana zostaniem centrum egzaminacyjnym PTE. Zapraszamy do kontaktu z nami. A teraz zapraszamy już na sesję, którą poprowadzi Rob Dean. Rob, the floor is yours. <laughs> Dziękuję bardzo. OK, thank you very much for coming. Goodbye. Oh, OK. Maybe not goodbye just yet. All right, welcome, welcome to those who've come for the third uh, of the sessions of the conference. Um, wonderful to see you. Thanks to those of you who's, who've just joined us. You know, at conferences, the last slot, like this one, are often referred to as the graveyard slots. Did you know that? Do you know why? Well, two reasons. One, everybody is so exhausted, having concentrated for the previous sessions of the conference, that they're so tired, and there's no noise. It's silent, like a graveyard. The other reason it's sometimes called that is because there are few people here. Everybody's gone home, so it's <laughs> deserted like a graveyard. But I'm really pleased to see that neither of these things have happened today, and that you're all here, and you're all with us. Now, I do promise that there will be no singing, no dancing, no jumping up and down in this session, unless you want to, of course. There's always ways of adapting things. Um, because this session is going to be looking at the subject of exams. Um, exams and specifically ways of taking the sting out of exams, ways of helping our students to be successful. So, if you say the word exam, to your students. What sort of response do you get? Can you show me? Show me the physical response from your students. What do they look like? Yes, I can see around the room. Faces like this. Yeah. Why is it? Why is it that exams do instill panic and disquiet among our students? Well, I think there are several reasons. First of all, there's the fear of the unknown. Nobody likes unknowns. Things like, what will we be tested on? Will we have to know this set of vocabulary or that set of vocabulary? What will be the topic for the writing? The mystery is, for many students, a bit disturbing. The other problem, of course, is the pressure that students feel with exams. Pressure from within, pressure from us, the teachers, but also pressure from parents too. You see, a lot depends on exams, doesn't it? Students' futures are often decided by their results from an exam, and that's scary. Um, back in the UK, my 16-year-old nephew, his waiting time for the results has just finished because the uh, GCSE exam results came out about two weeks ago. But before then, he was really stressed. His ambition is to be a doctor. And if he hadn't passed his science exams, he wouldn't have been able to go on to do his A-levels in sciences, which he would have needed in turn to be a doctor. So a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. As I say, the good news is he did pass. Of course, pardon me, of course, when we're under pressure, all sorts of strange things happen. Strange things in the exam room. Um, and I'd like to share with you now a couple of examples of that. 
a question that I'm sure we can all deal with very easily. Correct the error. The girl were extremely intelligent. Okay. Now, let's see. This is a genuine example of what a student wrote under pressure in the exam room in response to this question. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? You couldn't invent that one. And here's another one. Again, under pressure in the exam room, an unfortunate mistake. I think this was a biology exam, actually. Write a sentence to show the meaning of the word organism. You're laughing already. I think you know what's coming, don't you? What did the student write? Can you see that? Every living thing is an orgasm. From the smallest cell to a whole mammal, there are orgasms everywhere. I think it's true to say that as teachers we can have quite a lot of fun reading what students write and there'll be some more examples later on in the session. Um, incidentally, if you'd like more of these, I took these from a book that I bought some time ago in London. Um, it's a compilation of unfortunate things that students have written in exams. As you can see, it's called F in exams, F being the lowest grade, and F I think also stands for fail in this situation. Um, I doubt you'll find it in a Polish bookshop, but you'll find it online. F in Exams by Richard Benson, full of very, very entertaining examples. So, we are here today to try and help our students avoid these unfortunate things. And we need to try and provide the right kind of help and support to enable that. First of all, ongoing language and skills development. Just because our students are preparing for an exam doesn't mean they've stopped learning English. So we need to keep helping them with the grammar, the vocabulary, the pronunciation, the reading, writing, listening and speaking. Of course they need exam practice, that's true. They need to be familiar with the kinds of tasks they will face, the multiple choice, the gap fills, the different kinds of writing, the different speaking activities. But that's not enough on its own, is it? They also need training in strategy how to go about answering these questions in the most effective way. Now, you saw the title at the beginning. I called this Getting Inside the Examiner's Head. It sounds very psychological, doesn't it? But the thinking behind this really is if we can help our students to think a bit like examiners, to understand how these tasks are structured and what they're really testing, that way they're in the best position to approach these tasks for the most effective result. So that's what uh, we're going to be focusing on. Um, I'll be focusing on strategies for all exams. Now, I'm using FCE Cambridge First schools as the basis, but bearing in mind that across all the different exam types, the tasks tend to be quite similar, a lot of the ideas from today will be relevant to Matura, to IELTS, to PTE, all sorts of different exams. And you've probably noticed there's a bit of an animal theme continuing. Um, I don't know why. Now, we'll be looking at examples from all the different areas, very briefly in the time we have. But just in case all that's really boring, which I hope it won't be, we'll be finishing off with a little video clip with a cautionary tale. Do you know what I mean by a cautionary tale? It's a story that contains a warning. And in this video, it's an example of what can happen if we don't prepare our students sufficiently for their exams. So that's something to look forward to. But in the meantime, I think we need to remind ourselves about the exams themselves. And Cambridge, um, how many of you here teach Cambridge first? What used to be known as FCE. A few of you do. Now, some of you will know that there have been some changes announced for 2015 just to keep us on our toes. Um, as you're probably aware, up to now, Paper 1 Reading and Paper 3 Use of English were two separate entities. From 2015, things have changed slightly. Do you know what's changed? Shh. They've merged. They've been conflated, put together as one paper. So the total time is shorter and the total number of questions reduced slightly but there's no effect on the actual weighting of these. The good news for us, for those of us who don't like change, is that the task content is exactly the same. So we don't have to learn and prepare our students for any new things that they haven't been doing already. 
Another change concerns the writing paper. Um, up to now, part one of writing was a compulsory letter or email. The word limits, as you can see, were different for parts one and two. But from 2015, what's changed? Yep, I can just hear you there. Okay, the uh, part one has become an essay. And the thinking behind this, I think, is quite logical, really, and that is because a lot of students go on to study at university after having taken the Cambridge First. The essay is a very good foundation for that academic environment. And you'll notice the word limit has been harmonised across the two parts, so increased slightly as well, which I think is good news. Have you ever tried to write an essay or a letter to 120 words? It's really quite difficult, I think. So personally, that's my own view. I think this is a big improvement. All right, so let's move into some specifics, some practical areas. And I'd like to begin with reading and listening. Now, I've put these together. I've put these together simply because the task types are very similar. I realize the skills involved and the subskills differ, but the strategies are actually fairly similar. Typical problems then. Well, really, it boils down to vocabulary in my experience. Because the questions and the text involve students making connections using vocabulary, it's these connections that are often missing because students don't have that vocabulary. So let's get inside the examiner's head. Let's see how these, how these te texts are and tasks are structured and see how we can help. So, to begin with, a picture. I've taken this from the course Gold Experience, and this picture shows, obviously, two people, but what's going on? What's the text about, do you think? Can you predict from this? An argument. It does look like there's some sort of conflict here, doesn't it? Exactly. What this is about is giving students the chance to predict and then to read the text for general meaning to check their prediction. You see, what often happens, and maybe you've seen this across many exams, you give students an exam task and they straight away start trying to answer question one. And they've forgotten to do something important, to read the whole text first. How can you work in detail on a text if you don't know what it's about? So, obviously, in the exams, there are very rarely GIST-type questions, but in the course books, there are. And the thinking behind them is to get the students into the habit of reading for general meaning before going into detail. I will tell you what this is about, because that's too small for you to read. All right? This is all about a reality television show in the UK called The World's Strictest Parents. And basically, prob have you got anything like this in Poland? You have, so you'll be familiar with it. Problem kids, or their parents, apply to go on the show. They go off to some new parents for the duration of the television show, and then afterwards they reflect on the results of the strict discipline that they've undergone. So that's what's going on here. This guy's got an interesting name. He's called Chesdan. I've never heard that name before, but it is apparently an English name. Um, and that's his uh, temporary parent giving him some instructions. What we've actually got here is a text on which the students work with multiple choice. Let's have a look at it in more detail. Question one. Before Chesden went on the TV show, and then we've got our four choices. Now what I like to do with students at the beginning is give them the correct answer and then talk about the strategy involved. Why is the answer correct? So the answer in this case is D. He was hard to discipline. Let's have a look at the text and see which part of that text tells us that this is correct. And you can probably see there, okay, I was rude, obnoxious and difficult. I'd stay out all night and if she objected, I'd ignore her. Lesson number one for the students, of course, is that this match, okay, it's the same meaning, but expressed using two different sets of words. So what we're saying is the correct answer will not necessarily contain the same words as what's in the text. There will be, however, something known as a distractor. We're familiar with distractors, aren't we? Another way to call them negatively, a trap. 
And the trap here is this. A, he gave his parents nightmares. The uninitiated would see the word parent and nightmare and think, yep, that's the one. Brilliant, fantastic, let's move on. They've fallen into the trap. Let's have another look at, an, a look at another example. Here's another one. Uh, the next question is, Chesdon signed up for the world's strictest parents because he, and that's the correct answer, thought he'd have a good time. All right, I'm not going to show you the text just yet. What I'd like you to do is think about how this have a good time may be expressed in the text. What do you think? Have fun is a good one. Any others? Enjoy is a good word, yes. Any others? Should we see what's there? For kicks, that's a really good one. I like that. Very similar, actually, in meaning uh, to, to for kicks. In fact, what it is, have a giggle. To have a giggle is a very informal way of saying have a good time. A giggle being a little laugh. So once again, a correct match, same meaning, different words. And it's there again, look, there's the distractor. He thought he could make people laugh, and there is the word laugh. Again, the uninitiated would choose that, thinking they got it right. So nine times out of ten, in my experience, the correct answer will not include similar vocabulary. So it's all about, basically, expressing the same thing using different words. For example, synonyms, antonyms. And I have a little activity for you here. How's your memory today? Have you got good memories? Have you? I've heard in Krakow you have fantastic memories. We're going to find out. I have a challenge for you. Um, here's a little activity you could use with students to help them develop vocabulary, particularly synonyms and antonyms. I'm going to describe for you eight words using their synonym or antonym. I'd like you to remember those eight words without writing them down. So this is an, a, a situation where I'd like to put your pens down, all right? No cheating. Are you ready for the challenge? Can you do it? I hope so. All right, here's the first one. Um, the first word is the opposite of hot. So you've got that in your head now, yeah? Okay, right. Try and remember the others as well. This word is the opposite of boring. Okay, there are two possibilities for that, actually, or more. This word is a synonym for automobile. Number four. This is the opposite of often. Okay, the next one. This means the same as not long ago. The next one is a synonym for recall. Recall. The next one is the opposite of arrive. And finally, this one is a synonym for purchase, something you do in a shop. Okay, so those are the eight words. Now, that's quite a tough challenge, but with the person next to you, I'll give you a minute. See how many of those you can remember together. Off you go for a minute. <coughs> Okay, time's up. Time's up. How did you get on? Who remembered all eight? You did. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Seven. Superb. Six. Marvellous. Five. Very good. Four. Okay. <laughs> well done. It was quite challenging, actually, wasn't it? Here are the ones. Here are the words that I described. The second one could be exciting, couldn't it?
So the sort of thing you could put into the lesson as a little warmer, a little filler, a little revision activity at the end of the lesson, working on vocabulary, constantly playing with vocabulary is a good way of helping students to develop. In fact, students can make these little quizzes for each other, can't they? Yeah? You don't have to do all the work. Get the students to do the work. They're teenagers. They're old enough. Now, we've had an example there of what you might call a game in an exam classroom. Games and exam classes, do they go together? Yes, I think they do. As long as the game in question has an educational value, and I believe this one does. The authors of Gold Experience would agree, because throughout the pages of Gold Experience, you'll find examples of games, things for the students to do. For example, if they've finished early, things for the students to do, to challenge one another, to revise vocabulary, and so on. So, games do have their place. So, let's summarise this first part with reading and listening. We've only had time to look at one task type, um, but with multiple choice, getting students to be aware of what they're being tested on, particularly synonyms and antonyms. And this works too, in fact, for true-false tasks. Reading the whole text first applies to any exam task, be it multiple choice, true, false, whatever it may be. And of course, never leave an empty space. It's amazing, I've noticed over the years how many students have said, well, I didn't know that one, so I didn't answer it. Well, that's a wasted opportunity, because sometimes a guess can actually provide a mark. And sometimes those extra marks can be enough to take the students beyond the pass mark. All right, I'd like to move on. I'd like to move on, and I'd like to uh, move on by actually showing you a piece of material we've seen already. This is the paragraph, the first paragraph from the um, World's Strictest Parents text. What I'd like you to do with this in a moment is to look through it, just the first few lines, and try and identify how many collocations you can see there. Now, let me just define my terms here. Collocations. Anybody who's read Michael Lewis? Familiar to anyone? A few of you, yeah. Michael Lewis, he talks about the lexical approach. He talks about collocation. He talks about words that go together in terms of strong collocations, weak collocations, binomials, trinomials, fixed expressions, semi-fixed expressions, reversible expressions. I'm not going to go into that. Let's just say a collocation today for the purpose of this, words that go together. All right, so just with the person next to you, the first few lines, how many collocations can you find? Okay, in the first few lines, did you find more than two? More than three? More than ten? Well, I'll tell you what I found. Quite a few. Quite a few. Now, we might argue about some of these. I don't want to get into a discussion at this stage on this subject, but I think we can agree that there are examples in there of words that commonly go together. These days, an improvement in something at college, in tears, a long time. So language doesn't exist in isolation. Vocabulary is not just about single words, it's about groups of words. And this is where we can apply our knowledge effectively to an exam task, particularly close tasks. Close, otherwise known, of course, as gap fill. Now, the problem with gap fill is that students sometimes use their collocational knowledge from their own language and translate, and it doesn't always work. How many times have you heard your students saying, I was on the party? It's a common one in Polish, isn't it? Na impreja, translated literally becomes on the party. And of course, we don't say that in English. We'd say at the party. Um, 
A shortage of collocations tends to be the issue here, so let's see what we can do about it. If we go to a text, I took this again from Gold Experience, um, a text about living forever. Interesting concept. The first thing the students need to do here is read the whole thing. Even with the gaps, they can still get the sense as to what this text is going to be about. Um, there we are. We've got multiple choice for each of the gaps. And if we look more carefully and more closely at one of the examples, we can see that the four choices tend to be related. So here we've got hope, expect, long, and wait. They're all attitudes to something in the future. However, only one of them is going to fit into this gap here. But for some people, this is not enough. They something more. We know what goes in there, don't we? They expect more. But why don't the others fit? Because they don't. And that is often the frustration for students with collocation, a lack of rules. And we'll come to that in a moment. Let's just have a look at another one. Here's, uh, here's the next one. Cosmetic surgery can keep us looking young, but eventually our internal organs will something like the parts of an old car. I often find it helpful with students for them to look at the gap without looking at the options to begin with. Because very often the options get in the way. They might know what goes in there, and the options sometimes distract them. So let's have a look at this gap. What do you think might go in there? Deteriorate. Good one. OK, so we've established already it's a negative word. So deteriorate. Any other possibilities? Did I hear run out? Wear out? Let's have a look, shall we? Here are the options. We've got tire out, run out, wear out, and fall out. OK, four phrasal verbs, each with out. Only one of them matches, and that is? Wear out. And as I said, why? Why do words go together? The answer is because. And that, as I say, for a lot of students is a bit irritating. They want the rule. And when there is no rule, what can we do? You know, why do we say fish and chips? Why don't we say chips and fish? Why do we say salt and pepper? Why don't we say pepper and salt? Why don't we say on the party? Because. So what's the answer? The answer to me is really twofold. One, get students to notice language as much as possible. The activity we did earlier on, underlining all those collocations in a text, is a really neat way of getting students to notice what they've probably already encountered. Noticing is powerful. In everyday life, we notice things. Just for example, anybody here got a pet dog? Who's got a dog? You've got a dog. What sort of dog do you have? You've got a Yorkshire. Do you know I'm from Yorkshire? <laughs> I like your dog already. Okay, so you've got a Yorkshire, a Yorkshire. Okay, so you're walking down the street, okay, and coming the other way, there is um, a person with three dogs. One of them is a Labrador, one of them's a Poodle, and the other one's a Yorkshire. Which one do you notice? The Yorkshire, obviously. You've got a connection with it. It's the same, for example, if you drive a given sort of car. You drive a red Fiat, for example and a red fiat goes the other way. You go, oh look, it's like mine. And it's the same with language. Once you've noticed it, you've been exposed to it once, you see it again and it jumps out at you. And that's the principle involved in looking at a text in the way that we just did. Of course, there are games as well. We can play games, and we're going to play another one, in fact, right now. Um, I'm thinking of six words that can collocate with water. Okay, they go before water. All right, before I show you what I've got with the person next to you, can you try and think of six of your own words that might go before water? Off you go, very quickly. Okay, have you all thought of six? Has everybody got at least five? Right, okay. This progresses in the way that a very famous television show could progress. I'm sure you're all familiar with Familiada. A wonderful show. 
Well, it's not really. But I'll tell you what I do like about it. When I first came to Poland, I could understand it. It helped me with my Polish because the language in it was so simple. So the similar principle applies here, okay? We interviewed 100 people and got them to tell us what words went before water. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you the results. If you have the same, I'd like you to respond by shouting. What could you shout? OK, I'll tell you what. Hey. All right. Hey, if you've got the same. Let's just practice. One, two, three. Hey. All right, then. Are you ready? So our survey began with hot water, fresh water. Not much fresh water in Krakow. OK. Boiling water. Drinking water. You don't drink water here. OK. Mineral water. Oh, well, that's a good one. And finally, what do you think the last one might be? Running water, tap water, all good. I've got another one, though. Still sparkling. I've got dirty water. <laughs> Any haze for that? Anybody? All right. You get the idea. It's playing with words. It's playing with words. And actually, I prepared that within a matter of a minute or two. But again, it's something the students could prepare for each other. At home, they can go back through their notebooks, go through the course book. If they keep vocabulary books, which I know some students do, it's a challenge with teenagers to get them to do so. But it can be a good basis for them to prepare these little activities to use as a warm-up at the beginning of the lesson in small groups. So, to conclude this part, close tasks or gap fills, the strategy really involves getting students familiar with collocation and set expressions. Getting them to play games as we just have done and make quizzes and practice activities for each other. To notice language in context as we did underlining in that text. And of course, avoiding translation. It doesn't often work. Let's move on. Now, with this, we could probably make a list of problems that go all the way down the screen and across the floor and all the way to the back of the room. But I've got to prioritise because uh, we have a time limit. So what I'm going to dwell on are two areas. One is the problem of not really planning sufficiently and therefore not answering the question. Students do have a habit occasionally of either misreading a question or bringing to the exam room a pre-prepared answer that they hope somehow might fit the question, but doesn't. We've seen this, haven't we? We've all seen it. And of course, we've got the problem of accuracy uh, with grammar, vocabulary, punctuation, and so on. So let's have a look at what we can do. First of all, I think it's useful to have a look at an example um, question. I mentioned earlier there's not been much change here. Other than that, the, uh, exa uh, the um, essay question is now compulsory. The, the rubric's changed very slightly. This is going to be typical of what appears in Gold First. Um, sorry, in um, Cambridge First. The book's called Gold First. So, um, essay question. Is it better to make sport compulsory in school or to leave students to choose when to exercise? So, it's an opinion essay. And then the notes, things to write about, which would fit the school timetable best, which most students would prefer, and here's something new, your own idea. So to progress, I think it's useful at this stage to make sure students are aware of what it is they're being marked on. Now, FCE Cambridge uses a set of criteria, very similar, in fact, to criteria that's used throughout many different exams. Let's see if we can work out what they are. <clears throat> what do you think C stands for, the first one? Content, exactly. It used to be known as task achievement, so does it answer the question? CA would be communicative achievement. So stuff like functional language, register. Is it the right degree of formality? O would be? Organisation. Things like paragraphing and linking as well, that's part of organisation. How does it flow? And then L, this is the easy one, 
You've got that one, language, which we can break down into various areas, including accuracy. Range, that's an important one, isn't it? Range. Are students using sophisticated enough language for their level? So if they're B2, are they using B2 English? Or are they using A1 English, in which case the range would be bad? And, of course, spelling and punctuation. All right, then. What I've done... OK, we're going to make this interactive now. What I've done, I have written a partial answer to that question. All right? I would like you to be the examiners now. And I'd like you, first of all, to decide when you see my answer, if I took the exam next week and wrote this, would it pass or fail? That's the simple question. And again, it's reflecting the fact that, as with students who should read a text from beginning to end, before doing any detailed work on it. I firmly believe that as teachers, it's a good strategy to put our pens down and read all the way through a piece of student work before we start correcting it. Would you agree? All right, so your task here, a very global task, is, is it a pass or a fail? And remember, it's only a partial answer. I didn't quite finish it, but on what I have written, pass or fail? can hear some whispering. What do you think? What do you think? So, let's have a show of hands. If you would pass it, if you think it's a pass, show of hands. Don't be, don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Okay. If you think it's a fail, let's have a show of hands. Okay. And if you have absolutely no idea or don't want to tell me because you're frightened I'll be angry, a show of hands. All right. Um, so, more of you are in favour of failing it. And I think I will go in the same direction. If the student was taking the exam next week and they prepared this, I think there's enough wrong with it for them to get a serious warning. Okay, It's right on the borderline, I think, between band two and band three at FCE. Um, on balance, there's enough wrong with it for me to be very concerned as to whether that would pass in the real exam. A little note about marking exams, actually. It's interesting that as soon as you get two examiners together, you always end up with at least three opinions. So the fact that we didn't necessarily agree together here is nothing at all unusual, particularly when it's so borderline like this. So let's have a look at what could be improved with it. First of all, the content. Um, the content isn't brilliant, is it? We've got sports. What sports? Other things. What other things? Stay at home and do what? After-school activities. What after-school activities? There's not enough detail for my uh, liking in there. Not enough information. Just headings without examples. So we could improve the content a bit, I think. Um, communicative achievement. In other words, register formality. I don't reckon. And another thing. It sounds like somebody having a spoken rant. And it's really bad. Again, it sounds very spoken to me, does that? It could be improved to be more formal. So instead of, I don't reckon, we could encourage students to write, I don't believe, or I don't feel, more formal. Organisation, it's a bit of a disaster really, isn't it, when you look? Um, all those short sentences need linking. They don't flow. They're very uncomfortable to read. Stop, start, stop, start. And of course, we have absolutely no paragraphing. That needs sorting out as well. And I've indicated with the lines where I think the paragraph breaks could be. And then the language, there's all sorts in there. And you probably noticed those first. We often do notice bad spelling, bad grammar. It jumps out at us as teachers. So we've got collocation troubles, 
active from, um, stay at house, it should be stay at home, a set expression, spelling with words like compulsory. And also, we've got a bit of an issue with the word good. Have you noticed that? It's a bit boring to read the same word over and over again, isn't it? The range there could be developed. So what I've done here then is something I've actually done with my students, and I know it's time consuming. But once you have one of these prepared, you can use it time and time and time again. And I've used this with my students more than once. And the thinking is this, giving students a text with something to do, an important task attached to it, makes the whole process more memorable and effective. Some people say that if you give students a text with mistakes in it, they just copy the mistakes. But I say, if you give students a text without mistakes in it, they don't necessarily copy the good version. Worth thinking about, isn't it? Um, I would also add this. When it comes to developing writing, what I tend to do is I do step at a time. We've got everything in here all at once. I would probably deal with, for example, uh, spelling one week, maybe set expressions with another piece of writing, maybe focus in another piece of writing on um, linking devices, so breaking it down, and in fact that's pretty much what the course books do anyway. Of course we do need a reference, something that is a good piece of writing, and in the back of any of the courses you find in the writing file such as this, annotated, giving students clues as to what a good response would be. We've also got exam help, and what I love about this is it basically tells the students, this is what you've got to do, and here is how you do it. So we tell them that, the materials are telling them that as well. And this is the other thing, planning. I was in the Middle East not long ago, and I visited a school in uh, Bahrain, and it was quite interesting there to me how their exam system was very different, it was independent, but what they did was they allocated 25% of the marks for planning and the students actually had to show evidence that they actually planned their writing and they said to me what do you think about that and I said I think it's brilliant I think we should all do it um, I realize different exam systems work in different ways but planning what else have we got useful expressions particularly related here to an argumentative or opinion essay and of course checking how many of your students do you suspect write their essays at home, finish the last sentence, put the full stop, close the book, and then go watch TV? All of them. Just a little bit of checking can save an awful lot of red ink. So despite the support we give them, of course students will still make mistakes. They still get it wrong. But are mistakes such a bad thing? Are they? I don't think they are necessarily, as long as we learn from them. They're learning steps in a way. Um, a situation I had a while ago, as you know, I travel a lot. I was in Italy and I hadn't been to Italy for a long, long time. And I made a terrible non-linguistic mistake there. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. We went to a cafe, sat down. I was with three Italian colleagues. They all ordered espresso, microscopico coffee, about this big. And what did idiot brain here order? Cappuccino. <laughs> And what was the look on the waiter's face? Horror. And my three colleagues said, you have just committed the worst cultural crime you could ever commit in Italy. They won't let you back in. <laughs> you know why, of course. In Italy, you never drink milky coffee after midday. I'd forgotten that. I've learned from it. And I think we can learn from linguistic mistakes in much the same way. We started off with some examples of things that students had written that came from the book, F in exams. I've got some that now come from my own students. Over the years, from Lower Silesia, here in Poland, um, I'd like you to have a look at the greatest hits. Choose which one you like the best.
All right. Which is your favourite? Expensive Maria. That's a good one, isn't it? And I think one of the interesting things about mistakes, written mistakes like these, or indeed spoken mistakes, is interpreting what it is the students were trying to say and how it went so badly wrong. Um, in this first one, we can see that somebody's used a bilingual dictionary in not quite the right way. Dear and expensive are synonyms, aren't they, in the context of prices, but of course, in greetings, they're not. Um, articles. Christmas in Turkey sounds marvellous. Sun, sea and sand. Christmas in the Turkey is like that episode of Mr. Bean. Do you remember it? <laughs> Horrible. Um, cremated coffee. If you add oxygen to something, you oxygenate it. If you add carbon to something, you carbonate it. If you add cream to something, you add cream to it. You don't cremate it. <laughs> Not usually. Um, number four is interesting because it's the only one that's really a grammatical problem. The others are vocabulary or pronunciation related. So, my sister is having three cats is a biological miracle. <laughs> my, my sister's having a baby. Um, eat and feed cause confusion in this sentence with the result that my sister forgot to eat the dog. <laughs> what else have we got? Spelling. G-N versus N-G. G-N is a much rarer word ending in, in English. You've got words like sign, design, assign, foreign, but not many others. ING is very, very common. To trip on the mountains sounds painful. And I just love the last one. I'm not quite sure where it came from, but it's wonderful, isn't it? Learning steps, learning steps. And I've used these a number of times with students as well as um, with teachers in these sort of events. Of course, typically what you'll tend to find is a less colourful um, selection of mistakes. But what I like to do after I've marked a class of um, essays is put the mistakes on the board for the students to work together and to try and correct them. So you might have things like this. Sport are essential, I very like. That's a classic, isn't it? Very like. Um, this isn't a mistake grammatically, is it? I was at the gym yesterday. Sounds okay to me. But how natural is it? It's not very natural, is it? What, what are we more likely to say? I went to the gym yesterday or I spent yesterday afternoon at the gym. Yeah, this sounds like we're waiting for the sentence to continue. I was at the gym yesterday when I saw Lady Gaga. You're waiting for something else in this situation. And I don't believe only in sharing what's bad, what needs improving. I believe in sharing good things as well. So pick out of students' writing things that are particularly effective, particularly impressive, and let everybody see them. It's an example of something called differential feedback, where essentially what we're doing is praising and encouraging the students for what they've done well, but challenging them at the same time to improve, to get better. So I make sure they copy this from the board with these appropriately corrected. So to summarise, strategies, planning and checking, I think as we've established, is everything. And increasingly the course materials are becoming much more focused to guiding the students to do this. Getting students to keep an organised file is a good thing I've tried to do over the years. So, for instance, their essays marked by the teacher, the model essays they may have had in the form of the one we corrected earlier on on the screen, um, examples of language they've copied from the board, like the last slide we had, keeping them all together so the next time they do an essay they can refer back to what they did last time and hopefully avoid the same mistakes. They are speaking. They're not about to kill each other. So the speaking paper. Um, again, lots of problems we can encounter here, but in the short time we have, I'd just like to focus on one area, and that is functional range. What do I mean here? In the situation, for instance, where students are asked to discuss something, coming up with dull language like this. I agree. I disagree. Ah, but I agree. No, I disagree. But I agree. And it really sends the examiner to sleep, as well as the students involved in the process. So let's see how we can help. How can we improve this? Well, in the old days, course materials didn't really do very much to develop students' command of functional language. We probably all remember the kind of materials from 20-odd years ago, where before a speaking activity, we might find some boxes like this. And the instruction would be, 
When you speak, use these expressions. And did the students use these expressions? Very rarely. It was easier not to. And the simple reason behind that really was the fact that, for instance, there's very little information given about these. Are they formal? Are they informal? What's the appropriate response to these? And the other problem here, of course, is that some of this language is just old-fashioned. It's not stuff we even say anymore. I can't remember the last time I heard somebody say, you must be joking. It's quite dated. So what's the alternative? Well, more realistically, modern-day course materials are reflecting what people really say. And not just what people really say, but ensuring that a text box like this has a task associated with it. So students actually interact with the language. So what we've got here is, in fact, a speaking. It's the collaborative task from the speaking paper in the form of a mind map now. It's changed very slightly in Cambridge First, where we've got the students as magazine editors, and they have to decide what goes into this magazine. They listen to somebody else doing the task. They notice which of these expressions are used, and then they go ahead and work on a role play situation themselves using some of these expressions that they've already heard and identified. And you'll notice modern expressions. People go mad about things like that. 20 years ago, that would not have been in a course book. And yet, it reflects what people really say because language is living, it's changing, it's moving. We can go a step further, actually. In the intro, you probably uh, remember Agnieszka mentioning the uh, switch on which is the video component that comes with Gold First, Gold Experience. Um, we're about to watch a short clip, actually, featuring these two guys. This is Kyle and this is Jasper. Um, great names. And they're going to be having a chat about school. Specifically, is school too easy? Of course, with any receptive skill, we need to make sure there's a task. And the task the students are given is twofold. A gist task, so they listen and watch for general meaning first, so which topics are mentioned, and then a more detailed task where they listen and watch again for more specific information. Your task, though, is different. What I'd like you to do is watch this and think about what language in this video could be useful to pull out and highlight for students in their own speaking activities. OK, so let's meet our two teenagers. This is Kyle and Jasper. Hi guys, welcome back. I'm Kyle and today I'm joined by Jasper. Hi guys. Now, there are loads of news stories about how school is so much easier nowadays. Um, I mean, so we asked you your opinions on this and you came up with some main points that you want us to discuss. And these were exams, discipline and technology. Now, first off, exams. I certainly didn't find them easier. Um, I really, really struggled with the exams I just did. So, Jasper, what do you think? I mean, there's, there's no real way of telling because we can't do both exams. Yeah. Um, but I know for a fact that I found, or we both found, our last history exam very, very stressful really and it was quite difficult. So, there, it's not really any sure way of telling, is there? Uh, of course. Um, I mean, as you said, there is no way of us knowing. We weren't in school when our parents were. So, um, from our own experiences, exams certainly aren't easier. Um, the next point, obviously, is discipline. Now, discipline has changed so much over the years. Jasper, what are your thoughts? I have to go with my parents on this one. Right. They've always told me stories okay. of them being taken up to the front of the class and being given a smack on the wrist for being bad and it stopped them from doing anything. Whereas now, we've just got detentions, which isn't, isn't quite as strong, I don't think. Mm, no, I completely agree. I don't think detentions are enough. But obviously, um, nowadays, there's only so much you can do with discipline in schools. So, yeah, um, that, that, that's my opinion, personally. Um, so the next point we really wanted to talk about is technology. Now, obviously, technology has changed so much since our parents were in school. Um, we have technology at our fingertips. We have computers, tablets, phones. Wherever we want information, we can get it. So I mean, it's just very accessible. Yeah. It's, it's accessible for everyone to get any sort of information, but it is nice to have the books there as well it's, as, a, as a reference point. It's just made things a lot more accessible for us to use, not necessarily easier. 
Well, you know, I'd have to disagree there. I mean, I really like being able to go to the internet and I find it easy to get the information quickly so I can get my homework over and done with as quick as possible, really. So, um, yeah, whether you agree with us or not, we really want to hear from you. Um, the points we have talked about today are exams, discipline and technology. Obviously, there is so much more that we could talk about. We want to hear from you, so let us know your points and come back next time. See you later, guys. Bye, guys. I thought I waved my hands around a lot. Perhaps compared to him, I don't, do I? Memorable in its own way. Yeah, he's quite a character. He's quite a character. Um, quite a lot of natural language in there. A lot of natural language indeed. I mean, we're talking a lot about uh, expressions for expressing opinions, expressions for agreeing, expressions for disagreeing in a natural, if slightly eccentric at times, kind of way. But all making it memorable. Follow on tasks. And again, it's not just about previewing, not just about during viewing, but about things we can do afterwards. Um, getting students to react to certain things that they heard in the video. So is it important to have printed books as well as technology? And this is a nice feature, a little project. So getting students to work in groups and, in this case, carry out interviews and put together a little film, little podcast. Um, these days, with the availability of smartphones, you remember this one that my nephew said is no good, but this still does have a camera in it that will make videos, so if this does, any will. All right, um, strategies for speaking. I think maximising classroom opportunities and letting students to develop fluency in the classroom is a very valuable thing to do, and also to expose students to real English as much as possible. So in the classroom, we've got the video resources. We've seen Kyle and Jasper. The, they feature quite a lot in the courses in the Gold Experience, but there are also videos, um, more of a CLIL sort of variety, um, the world around us, documentary type material. What else? The materials themselves. So I've shown quite a lot of stuff straight from the pages of Gold Experience, the B2 level. Um, in fact, just about everything you've seen has been inspired by and has come from this. We mentioned the requirements for successful exam prep, language support, and this comes in three forms. You've got grammar experience, word experience, which is vocabulary, and language experience, which de deals with functional expressions. As we said, it's not just language, it's not just exposure to exam tasks, it's also exam strategy. And the books are absolutely packed with these. These little light bulb sections with exam give students support and tips and strategies for all the different areas of the exam, whatever that exam may be. You'll have also notice the topics that crop up in here. The two that we've specifically uh, focused on here started with the uh, television show about um, the uh, world's strictest parents. So parenting, very popular with the teenagers. And then just recently their school with technology and discipline. Right, I mentioned at the beginning that I was going to finish with a video clip. Just in case everything up to now has been boring. I hope it hasn't. I hope it hasn't. Um, I'm finishing with a, sh a short video clip. This shows what can happen if we don't prepare our students for exams satisfactorily. The exam in question here is a maths exam. And there are two options in this exam, for students to answer a question on trigonometry or for students to answer a paper on, what was the other one? Calculus, that's right. I don't know maths. All right. The main character you will recognise very well indeed. Let's just hope that none of our students ever finds themselves in a situation as painful and unfortunate as this. <laughs> Done your revision? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> I've concentrated on trigonometry. Uh, I've done calculus mainly. Oh. I believe they concentrated on calculus last year. Oh. Oh, dear. <laughs> Quiet, ladies and gentlemen, please. The exam will commence in two minutes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you may open the envelopes containing your papers. The exam starts now.
two minutes, ladies and gentlemen. At the end, with those who answer the green calculus papers, please put them in the green box. And those who answer the white trigonometry papers, please put them in the white box. Please. Poor Mr. Bean. Actually, did you know that was the very first Mr. Bean ever made? And in my opinion, perhaps the funniest. But uh, we're all open to our, uh, entitled to our opinions, I think. All right. Well, it's time for me to say thank you very much. It's time for me to say cheerio. Time for me to say see you next time. And importantly, I wish you all the very, very best for a successful and happy new year. New school year, that is. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Dziękujemy Państwu bardzo, że zaścieli Państwo spędzić z nami dzisiejszy dzień. Mam nadzieję, że się podobało i zapraszamy ponownie. Będzie też można uzyskać certyfikaty i książki Gold Experience przy wyjściu. Dziękujemy bardzo.